That's good. The old ship of Zion. That's a good one. Plato talked about the ship of state, and they still talk about it today. Have your Bible turn to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 23, with me tonight. 2 Samuel, chapter number 23, and verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. Father, bless your word now. And give me wisdom in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified, that I may diminish and he will grow. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Now, if you've noticed, we've been on a theme for the last few weeks. We're in First and Second Samuel. We get into Kings. We get into Chronicles. And just keep in mind that First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Chronicles are historical books, history the history of ancient Israel. And we're talking about David. This is the throne that God said he would establish forever. There would never fail a man to sit on the throne of David. And David, of course, is uh, beloved of God. David is the Hebrew for it. He's beloved of God. And the Bible talks about the sure mercies of David. Therefore, God exalts and holds him higher than any king that Israel had in the Old Testament. David had mighty men. He had three that were the closest to him. Then he had another 30. And these were the elite of the elite. These were warriors. And they were the best warriors that Israel could produce. If you remember, Benaiah went down into a pit. And what did he do in that pit? He confronted a lion. He sure did. See anybody do that lately? No, that took courage. And of course, this is uh, courage among all of them. So these are Gibberim, that's the Hebrew word for it. That means a male, mature, strong, and mighty. Gibor is the Hebrew word. Gibberim is plural, means many of them. If you watched any of the, of, of the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, you saw eight young men carrying her casket. Well, these were grenadier guards. Their purpose in life was to be one of the most elite, probably the elite, the elite of the army of Britain, and they were to guard the queen. They were to guard her. They were to protect her, and they fight all over the world. 2,000 years ago, in the time of, uh, of uh, the Caesars, you had what's called a praetorian guard. That was their purpose, to guard the monarch and to see to it. And, of course, you know as well as I do, Caesar was assassinated, wasn't he, by Mark Anthony? You remember that? Brutus and Anthony, they, 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 they uh, executed, they murdered Caesar. And so we have a praetorian guard to stop that kind of thing. Get, David had some access in his understanding of God. One of them was a prophet. We know who one of them was. His name was Nathan. He also had those who had dreams. And then he had the Urim and the Thummim. Now the high priest would wear a plate this plate would have 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. On that plate would be a little sack built into it. And inside that was placed the Urim and the Thummim. Now the two words are Hebrew words and they mean lights and perfections. But just exactly what these were, nobody knows. Where they came from, nobody knows. There's not one word in the scripture about making them or anything of that nature. But we do know that David consulted with the Urim and the Thummim, and God would tell him whether he would go or not go. We also know that Saul consulted with the Urim and Thummim and got no answer, nothing, nothing from it. And so what did he do? He went to the witch of Endor to try to find out what was going to happen uh, with the battle that was upcoming. And of course, he had already driven all the witches out of the land, so here we are at a time of of need, it's amazing how that uh, <laughs> how a person's convictions can change, don't you think? Have you ever seen that? David had enemies. I want to give you a list of some of them. Life has enemies. You may not believe it tonight, but there are people who do not wish the best for you. And they may be a hostile enemy. They may be seeking to destroy you and going about to tear you down. So we don't know that. We don't know for certain what's happening. And as a matter of fact, that's a blessing from God 
for him not to tell me what everybody in here tonight's thinking. Amen. That's a blessing. Believe me. You, need, <laughs> you better believe it. All I care about is the one who does care. That's the one that matters. Ahithophel was one of his enemies. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 16 and verse number 23 about Ahithophel. 2 Samuel 16, 23. Now watch carefully what you're reading here. 2 Samuel 16 and verse number 23. The Bible says, The counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. Now look at that. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. And of course, he was caught up in the rebellion of Absalom. But the word of Ahithophel was held in high esteem. He would be like one of the counselors to the president. Very wise, very smart. But we also know he was an enemy of David. Why was he an enemy of David? He had a grudge. He had a personal grudge. And what was that? He was the grandfather of Bathsheba. He had a personal grudge because David had, first of all, killed his son-in-law and had done what he did to his, or his grandson-in-law and, and had done what he did to his granddaughter. And she went through somewhat. Then not, enough, not much is said about Bathsheba. But Bath means the daughter of Sheba. And she was Bathsheba, no question, a beautiful woman. But she paid dearly for it. She paid for it. And we know we go further than that, but we're not going to do it tonight. When David escaped from Absalom and went off in the field, they called Ahithophel in along with another counselor. And they asked, what should we do? Absalom said, what should we do? If they had followed Ahithophel's counsel, they would have caught David and David would have been done away with. Ahithophel says, gather together right now, right this moment, 12,000 troops and send them into the field after David. And he's unprepared for it. He's weak right now. He's fleeing from the capital and you will be done with David. But there was another one there. And he counseled that to wait until we can get all of the armies of Israel together and then we'll go out and we'll take David. You see, my friend, Ahithophel spoke the truth because that was true. God overruled it. This is one of the things about the Bible. The Bible's a powerful book. It's a very powerful book. You remember over there in the book of Exodus when they wanted to kill the firstborn males and what happened? They passed the word among themselves, and when they came and said, how come we're not getting a lot of mail? They said, well, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. When they get pregnant and ready to have a child, it just has it, and that's it. And so it's over with before we can get there and do anything about it. That was a lie, but God used it. Let me tell you something. You're not going to outsmart him. You're not going to go around him. You're not going to hoodoo him. You're not going to flim flam him. God Almighty means God Almighty. That's what it means. Now we have Job, Joab. He was a fierce warrior. He's an enemy of also of David. Why? Because you see, Joab knew David's bones that were in the closet. And uh, I guess there's a lot of us in this house tonight would kind of like to forget some of the old friends we used to have, right? Uh, do you have any old friends that used to run with you to places that you really wouldn't care about telling people about right now? And they know things on you? And this is Joab. He knew things on David. He knew things and he and David knew he knew it. So therefore he held some kind of a power and sway over David. The thing about Joab, he's like an awful lot of people. David's the king and God's blessing David and yet Joab knows some of the things that he did. And when somebody come to Joab and try to convert him or try to get him right with God, Joab would say, don't preach to me. Don't you preach to me. I know what's going on out here with these people and I'm just as good as the rest of them. And do you know the truth? That's true a lot of times. That's very true a lot of times. When you try to talk to somebody about the Lord, never Never make it about you and them. Always make it about the Lord Jesus and them. And you'll agree with Pilate when he said, I find no fault in him. And then, of course, the third 
the third. The third enemy of David, he had many, but these are three that I picked up because they fit in certain categories, is Absalom, his own son. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 14, let me read there, turn there with me and let's read it because reading something like this will stay in your mind. 2 Samuel chapter number 14, verse 25. 2 Samuel 14, 25. Now we'll look at verse 24. Absalom is the context. Verse 25, but in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his what? Beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. In plain words, if you live life following the outward appearance, then you would love Absalom. He had a beautiful body. He was the kind that from the outward appearance and from the flesh and all that it had to offer, he had a following. But I'm going to tell you tonight, I had much rather see somebody with a beautiful soul than a beautiful body. So you're the most beautiful thing in the world. Let's come back 50, 60 years down the road and see how beautiful you are. Let's see what the wear and tear of this world does to you. See, that's why the Bible said beauty's vain. The physical beauty won't last. And so if you're one that's the eater of flesh and you live for the beauty, then you're going to be constantly changing from one to the other. And that's what a lot of husbands are like. They're like that. In the book of Malachi, it says that, why have you departed from the wife of your youth? And they did. They had departed from the wife of their youth and gone after younger women. You mean these Jews did that? Listen, folks, the Bible's the Bible. This is a real book about real people who lived real lives just like you. This is not a book about a bunch of saints with wings flying around that live in some kind of an ethereal world. This is a real book. And so these Jews had dispatched their wives and the wives had grown older with them. And so what they do, they go out and find them a young woman. And of course, you know, Solomon didn't do much to help the situation, did he? I was, I was thinking today about Solomon. I thought, you reckon he even knew the names of all thousand of his wives and concubines? Well, if he did, he's got a good memory, don't you think? Amen. And David had a bunch of them too. He had wives and concubines. He had children by all those wives. You know what he said in Matthew chapter 19? The Lord Jesus said to them, male and female created I them, one man and one woman. And he said it was not so with all of this polygamy or all of this, uh, all of this that they had in the Old Testament. That wasn't God's will, but he tolerated it. And God will tolerate a lot of things out of somebody until they grow up and learn some things. And the more you learn, the more you're accountable. And if the fact you don't want to learn, that makes you even more accountable. Amen. You got the light, accept the light, believe the light, and receive the light. And you can begin to walk with God. But if you refuse it, you're in trouble. And so we have Absalom. How many tonight would answer this simple question? How many believe that Absalom loved himself? This is, the, this is the greatest narcissist in the Bible. Right here. Absalom stood before the mirror every day. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most beautiful of them all? It was Absalom. I mean, ladies, I'll do you a favor and I'll take you out. That's Absalom, full of himself. And you can always tell when somebody's full of themselves. They may give Christ lip service, but their heart's not in it. And we get too much of that today. We got a lot of theological talk, high sounding, high brow junk, but we know the heart is not in it. Let me tell you how to tell the heart's in it. You don't want to be seen. You don't want to be known. It's not about you. It's about the Lord Jesus. You'll do everything you can to get his name before people because he can help you, dear friend. He can help you. So we've got Ahithophel, Joab, and Absalom. And you know what happened to Absalom? There's something else about Absalom, too. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's quite a type of the Antichrist. You see, when the man of sin shows up, he'll be the epitome of human flesh, achievement, beauty, glory, power. He'll be the greatest human of all humans. And this will be the one they go after. And Satan's grooming somebody right now for that job. We don't know who he is, but he's grooming somebody. I believe in every generation, Satan grooms somebody and has them prepared for that. Now, let's talk about some of his friends. David had his enemies, but he also had his friends. 
Uriah, 2 Samuel chapter number 11 and verse number 11. He carried his own death warrant into battle and Joab handed it to him. You see, this is one of the bones in David's closet that Joab knew about. Joab knew that through David's treachery that Uriah the Hittite had died. He was faithful to David. Even though he was ignorant of what David's plan was for him, he was faithful to him, even to death. Now, my dear friend, that's a friend. That's a friend. Faithful to death. So Uriah was. He goes down in the Bible as one of the great men in Scripture, and he was a Hittite, Uriah. He loved David. Look over here in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 20, verse number 17, and here's another friend. 1 Samuel, chapter number 20, verse 17. Now, when David came to the throne, it was over the house of Saul. That meant that there was a lot of enemies between the house of David and the house of Saul because the house of Saul thought that David had taken the kingdom away from Saul illegitimately, that God wasn't in it. And so therefore they despised David for what he had done. Jonathan was the son of Saul. As a matter of fact, Jonathan, like there would be in England, he's the prince of Wales. He's the crown prince that when Saul dies, Jonathan becomes the monarch of the house. So what happens? Jonathan is wise. He knows that the kingdom has been taken from Saul and given to David. And so therefore he makes an agreement, an alliance with David. But look how it's based on. Look at verse number 17. And Jonathan calls David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Here is a love between two men that is nothing greater in the Old Testament. I mean, these two men loved each other. There was something special about it. Some kind, I can't explain it, but they loved each other. Now, let me tell you something about this love. <coughs> if you've got a perverted mind tonight, you're messed up. This has nothing to do with perversion. They simply loved each other. Jonathan loved David and David loved Jonathan. Jonathan saved David's life and David knew it. And David swore and said, yes, you will be spared and your house once I become the king. Do you remember what happened when David went into his house to sit down? He had this long table in front of him and he said, what can I do for the house of Saul that I may show my love and my appreciation for his son, Jonathan? How many remember what he did? He went down to Lodibar, didn't he? And he found a fellow down there by the name of, what's his name? Mephibosheth at Lodibar. Brought him back. Mephibosheth was lame in his feet. Mephibosheth said when he got there, why would you show mercy to a dead dog like me? And he did it for Jonathan's sake. Now that's a mark of his character. That's a good thing. It shows that he's true to his word, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. There was a time in this country when two men agreed with a handshake, and that was it. It was it. It was it. That's it. No, you don't need any courts of law. You don't need any papers to be, to be signed. That handshake represented their character, and their character was everything when the community where they lived, and they stuck to it. Wouldn't it be nice if we do that again? I wish that we'd find character like that in the church. Don't you? We're, 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 we're sadly needing character. And anyway, this is a friend that is based on love, unconditional love. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ is to us, unconditional love. The more I know him, the more I love him. The longer I know him, the more I love him. The more I read his word, the more I love him. I've been reading the Bible for decades, and now some parts of the Old Testament are just now beginning to make sense to me because I see the depth of what it's saying. I begin to understand it. What is really going on here? And I appreciate it. I love him. I love him tonight. If he takes my life before I walk out that door, I want you to understand you're looking at a man that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you ever see me again or not is irrelevant. His name, him, he is the one that matters. I must decrease. He must increase. Who said that? 
That's right. John the baptizer, John the Baptist. As the, uh, as the Baptist writers say, he was the first Baptist. <laughs> They're wrong. <laughs> He's a friend of the bridegroom, stands by. But the Lord said of John the Baptist, of all those born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John. Now in 2 Samuel chapter number 17, we find another friend. Now all these friends represent a class. They represent a group. In 2 Samuel chapter number 17 and verse, verse number 27. And it came to pass when David was come to Mahinam, that Shobi, the son of Nahash, of Rabbah, the children of Ammon, and Maker, the son of Amiel, of Lodibar, and Barzaliah, the Giladite, of Rogelum brought beds and, ves and, ba and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and so forth. And they brought all of this to David to feed him. You see, Barzillai was a true friend, true friend. Now let me tell you something about friendship. A lot of people talk like they want to be your friend and they talk like they are your friend. Words are cheap. If I'm down and I'm out and I'm hurting, the one that sticks with me and comes to me, that's my friend. A friend will never forsake you. If he's a real friend, he'll bear your burdens. And let me tell you something else about a friend, too, a real friend. He knows all your warts and all your problems and all your misgivings and all your faults, and he's still your friend. That's important. That's really important because there's an awful lot of preaching out here today that if you're not walking a perfect line and cross all the T's and dot all the I's, God's not got no use for you and he's going he's to hang you up somewhere and let you dry. No, he's not. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's your friend. You remember what they accused him of? They said a friend of publicans and sinners. Well, that's the truth. His enemies said that and they told the truth. He is a friend of publicans and sinners. Do you know something? A sinner needs a friend. You know what the Bible says about the world? It says they hate each other. That's right. They hate each other. They use each other. They'll cut each other's throat in a heartbeat. And the only reason, most of the time, the only reason they have anything to do with each other is whatever they can get from each other. When they use them. They're not each other. They're not friends of each other. For the most part, most of them simply tolerate each other because they all live for self. Narcissism, folks. Self. That's just why I am livid when I hear some so-called preacher get up in the pulpit and tell you, you need to love yourself. That's your problem. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, know this in the last time, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves. To top the list of all that follows, that's the first thing he mentions. Well, didn't the Lord tell you to love yourself? No, he said to compare with how you love yourself. Nowhere in the Bible, folks, nowhere in Scripture are you commanded to love yourself. It says in the New Testament, no man ever hated his flesh. That's what it says. Think about that. Why? For the flesh, the flesh is your life. And to an unsaved man, that's all the life he knows. And if his body dies, he's finished. So therefore, he lives for his flesh. But you remember what David said when his little boy died? He poured his soul, his soul out to God and cried out to him. And, uh, you know, he sat in sackcloth and ashes and begged God to save him. But the Lord took the little boy, took him on anyway. And David washed himself, sat down and ate, carried on with his life. He said, what's wrong here? While the boy was alive, you were praying, crying. Now he's gone. Why aren't you in sackcloth and ashes and crying out and hurt. He said, I can't bring him back, but I can go to him. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's heavy-duty theology for the Old Testament because you've got a bunch of liberal devils out here running around teaching that nowhere in the Old Testament did any of them believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in an eternal state. They didn't believe in any of that. Of course, Job said in 1935, though the skin worms destroy this body or this flesh, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, not myself. I'll see him, right? Of course he did, and that's 1900 B.C. David firmly believed in a resurrection, and he believed he'd see his son again. And that's one of the greatest comforts there is, to sorrow not as others that have no hope. 
If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another of these words. He said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. John, I am he that liveth and was dead. He said, Behold, John, look good. I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of hell. The body dies, but not the soul and spirit, nor memory. That's one of those things you can't be too sure of, but you can think about it. What do they know right now? What about a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a dear one, a dear family member, someone that you love dearly? Now they're gone. You suppose they're kept, you suppose the Almighty keeps them in touch with what's going on down here, especially if some of the family members to get saved or something like that? Who knows? Nobody can tell. Let me tell you something. Don't ever, don't ever let anybody tell you they can't. I was listening to a dear brother the other day, and I love him and I respect him. I won't tell you his name because he's a good man. He's a very good man. But he was talking about the witch of Endor when Saul went to her. You remember that? We talked about it earlier. And uh, she went through her, her demonic ritual, and she was going to conjure up an impersonating demon. That's what she was going to do. She's going to bring up... A familiar spirit is what they're called in the Bible. That's what she was going to do, bring one of these up. But she was upset. She fell backward. She said, what have you done? What have you done to me? For God raised Samuel. And I believe that. Now, some don't. But I believe it was Samuel. He brought him up. Now, the brother said this. He says, now, this is nothing but a witchcraft deception that, there, that, the, that the dead don't come back. That, that, was, that there's no way in the world that that was Samuel, that was a demon, and God had nothing to do with it. I said, brother, what about the top of that mountain of transfiguration? Who came back there? Moses and Elijah. Were they impersonating spirits? If they were, the Lord Jesus didn't have enough sense to know who to talk to. No, God brought them back from the dead. Are well, you saying, preacher, you got dead people walking around? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying this, that he's the one that opens the door and shuts the door to death. He, can, he is absolute God Almighty over death and hell and the grave. That's why Paul said in him we live and move and have our being. Because he holds the secret things. And there are secret things. You remember when Christ died on the cross? There was a great earthquake. Great earthquake. God shook the earth. The sun was gone. It was pitch dark, and the earth is shaking. I can imagine how terrified those people were. And the Bible says the graves were opened. This opened up. God shook the ground. The graves opened. And there they are open. And they could walk by and they could see the grave. What's happened? That's my grandfather's grave. What's going on here? And some wild animals are going to come along. And they're going to get down in there. They're going to take the body. I can't have that. And the Bible says that these graves were opened. And then when Christ arose from the dead, three days later, three days later, he arose from the dead. The scripture says, and many of them arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. Now, make sense of that. I believe it, but I don't know where, to, where do you place it. <laughs> what, you know, where does that fit? But it happened as surely as you're here tonight. They got up and they walked. And notice the way it says it too. It says the bodies of the saints arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem, right? You know, the, 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 scriptures, the scripture could have said, and many of the saints of God arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. If that had been what it said, you'd say, well, there's the whole person. <laughs> Are you following me now? Yeah. Instead, just a body? Well, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm not, I'm, what I'm saying to you tonight is, I don't know, but I know it happened. And it's a mystery to define everything that's involved with it. It's just like people who, on their deathbed, there's a man named Alexander over here in North Carolina. He's a doctor. And he went through that, where he saw the light. He experienced this out-of-body experience. And then he came back. He had meningitis. He had spinal meningitis. He had the worst kind. 
And what it did was literally put his brain into a shock, shocked his whole body, and then he just shut down. His organs shut down. And he's a doctor. And uh, for all intent and purpose, clinically, he was dead. But he came back. Somebody said, well, that's all, you know, that's, that's okay. But that's mo all of that, that's just a bunch of lying, deceiving uh, witchcraft. What about Paul? I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body. Caught up to the third heaven. It's all thing. Then he came back. And I think historically that fits to where he was stoned outside. Where was that town? Lystra. Lystra. It's in the book of Acts. He was stoned, left for dead. and may very well have been dead, but God raised him back up. Can God raise the dead? Well, let me tell you something. When he saved your soul, raising a physical body, that's a big deal. But to raise a dead soul and dead spirit from damnation is greater by far. To see a profound change take place in somebody's life, there's nothing else that can do that. And that's what he did to me in 1973. You have to be quickened. The word quickened means made alive who are dead in sins and trespasses. Is he a friend? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. You need a friend? I've got a friend. Let me tell you about my friend. He knows all the bones I got in my closet. He knows all my warts, my besetting sins. He knows everything there is. He knows more about me than I know about me. Why? He knows what I'll do under certain circumstances that I don't even know yet. Yet he's still my friend. That's why I love him tonight. Amen. That's why I love him. He's our Lord and he's our Savior. And one of the last things he said before he left this body, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. You can be there too tonight. Yes, you can. You can. No man has ever had a greater friend than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one animal in this world, and you all know right off the bat what it is, that displays characteristics that I don't know of any other animal, and that's a dog. A dog will go to the gravesite of its owner, and it'll sit there. And it'll moan. Yes, it will. Because that dog misses that person. There's nothing, you know, dogs. They say a dog is a man's best friend. Well, generally speaking, a dog can be a very good friend. No question about that. You can read all the time about dogs that have saved little children. You know, or drug somebody. I remember reading not long ago, drug one out of a burning house. They can do all kinds of things. To me, that's what a friend's about. Now, if you're a friend of somebody tonight, I hope all of you are friends with each other, but that's not, not necessarily the case. But do you have anybody in this world that you call your friend? What if they did something that you didn't expect and it, and it really bothered you? Would you stop being their friend? Here's the thing. If you are really their friend, you're going to be their friend, regardless of what they go through. Their marriage may break up, and they're, on, they're in the wrong, but you're still their friend. Some girl messes around and gets herself pregnant. What do you do, throw out the back door, or are you still her friend? Amen. What if your husband runs off with another woman? You still be his friend? Yeah, you may not necessarily have to take him back in because adultery breaks a marriage. But are you still, would you not still want to see his best, to see him right with God and to see him cleansed? Yes, yes. Hate will eat you alive. It'll eat you alive. It'll suck the life out of your soul. It doesn't mean you have to approve of anything but you've got to understand that these things talking about friendship are powerful statements. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless your word. And thank you for the opportunity to come to the house. Maybe I've said something tonight that's helped somebody. I hope so. I really do. I hope so. 
I hope so. I've seen a lot and lived a few years in this world, Lord. And I've seen your word proven time and time and time and time again to be true. And I know you're my friend tonight. And I know if you have to chasten me, you're still my friend. I know if you have to deal with me, you're still my friend. And I'm thankful for it because I know you love me and you've got my best interest at heart. In Jesus' name, amen.